Eleanor Roosevelt said, do the one thing every day that scares you the most. I think she was one badass woman with some really good advice. Because all fear is is false evidence that appears real. Yet we respond to it as if it's a solid roadblock where all we're left to do is to hide behind it and play it safe. I too was guilty of this, even though for years and years I dreamed of becoming a rock star. When it was time to grow up, I fell into the monotony of life and did as so many of us do. After college, I, I became a teacher and I thought, well, well, here's a job with purpose. I'm giving back. Yet, every August when it was time to go back to school, I would have this pit in my stomach where I just knew that I wasn't serving, serving the highest potential that I could. See, that rock star dream, although it wasn't based on any specific musical talent, it had been since middle school since I'd picked up an instrument and I was in the high school choir, but parked in the, in the near back row. My point is that all those years when I kept saying that I wanted to be a rock star, I think what I was really saying was that I want to push the envelope. I would I'd watch those behind the music television shows or inside the actor's studio trying to analyze and figure out what it is that these people do to push, push those limits and why are they any different than, than us, us regular people. You know, what is it that they're doing that we're, that we're not? And I was just so fascinated by them that I, I remember, you know, certain episodes. One, I think it was um, No Doubt with Gwen Stefani, and they were talking about living in a van for seven years before they even got a record deal. Seven years traveling the country of just rejection after rejection, but yet they had this conviction that there was just no other choice. One of my favorite Inside the Extra Studios was... Uh, Adam Sandler, he, he was describing how awful he was when he first started and how he would get booed off stage. He would have knots in his stomach and feel like he was going to throw up before he got out there. Yet he did it day after day after day. And he joked about it. He said, well, because there wasn't anything else that I knew that I could do. But really what it comes down to is that he had no plan B. There was no other option. Because when you, when you give yourself a plan B, then you're already setting up in the back of your head the idea that you're not going to make it. So as I was teaching all those years and I was watching these shows, I kept just trying to put all the pieces together for myself. I didn't really know what it was I wanted to be. Certainly it wasn't a rock star. I just knew that I wanted to play a bigger game. I knew I wanted to be a part of something greater. Even though teaching is a great field, just for me there was something about it that just wasn't enough. And I could feel that. It was like palpable every year before I went back to school. And finally, into my seventh year of teaching, one August, I know it was really late in the game, but I went to my principal and I said, I'm really sorry, but I just can't come back. And that's how my story began. I just took the leap. I didn't have a job lined up. I didn't know where I was going to go. Thankfully, I didn't have a family or kids to worry about. But still, I was taking the steps towards my dreams, regardless of the fact that I didn't know what they were yet. I just knew that what I was doing wasn't, wasn't building on where I wanted to go. And I knew deep down that that wasn't serving me. So I started to take the steps to figuring out what it was that I wanted to be when I grew up. And I think that I finally figured it out. But it wasn't until I was living in Hawaii, just after I quit my job, I was sitting on the beach and I had just begun to learn how to meditate. I was doing so begrudgingly on most days, but on this particular day it was beautiful out. And I was sitting there, earnest as ever, my hands on my knees, tall, proud, my, my chest open, my heart my heart wide and I just began to beg, please tell me what to do. Please, I'll do anything, just tell me what to do. I probably begged for 15, maybe 20 minutes, maybe even a half an hour. And in that begging, I got quiet enough that I actually heard a voice. And I'm not one to hear voices. The voice kind of sounded like Wayne Dyer, if you want to know the truth. But the voice said, tell your story. And in that, I realized, one, not only do I have a story that I'd sort of forgotten about in, in many ways, but 
too, it just gave me a purpose because if I realized if I tell my story, maybe it would help people get outside of theirs. I just thought that maybe if I exude this bravery and, and going after my own fears and going after my own dreams, that I could also bring others up with me to do so. At the time, I was thinking about students, maybe outside of the classroom, getting on stage. And I felt so empowered by that in that day. I had no idea what that meant or how I was going to put it into practice. But just having that inclination of what it was that I could do was so huge. Well, I'm still working on getting all those things into place, but what I have accomplished was that last year I was able to write my first book. And I think it's all tied in and all correlated. But what it was was just taking baby steps each day. You know, you don't sign up for a marathon and then go out there and run the 26 miles. You train for it. You go into the gym and you do a little bit by a little bit. So when Eleanor Roosevelt said, do something that scares you the most every day, maybe she doesn't mean climb Mount Kilimanjaro tomorrow. Maybe she means start with baby steps. Do something, if you're scared of being in front of the camera, then each day get yourself in front of the camera. If you're scared of rejection, then each day find a way to set yourself up so that you might be rejected. Because what happens is you'll realize that you're not going to die. You realize that the world won't shatter. You realize that it's really not so bad. And your body sort of gets used to it. I guess that's what Adam Sandler felt all those times getting up there and being booed at and being rejected. He knew he wasn't going to die. But in the back of his head, he had no plan B. And that's the most important thing. You know, during my journey as I wrote my book, I had no idea sitting down, how do I write a book? There's no, there's no manual about how to do that. There's no, nothing to follow, no one to teach you exactly where to go. You write one word, and then you write two, and then you keep going. I've made this joke before. I backspaced on many days, way more than what I wrote. But in the long run, it turns out that I actually have a finished, a finished project. And I'm no different than anybody else. It's just that I stood up one day and I said no more. And that's all I'm asking for you to do to walk away from something that you, you know deep down isn't serving you. And maybe you don't do it all at once. Maybe you start with just a few hours a day, just a hobby, just, just going to the library and researching possibilities. I know it may sound silly to go after your dreams, cliche. You know, we've, we've um, gotten so far away from that. But I think it's so important because you know, we hear about these people that go to their graves and they say, you know what, I wish I had done this. I wish I wasn't scared enough to do that. I think with, you know, 2012 and all of us wondering whether the Mayans really were right, or these shootings that happened in Connecticut where we lost all these, these children, you know, we see dreams die within us and people every day by people either ignoring them, by people just acting like everything is fine. Being caught up in, in the monotony. They're denying themselves those dreams and those dreams are just as visible a death as having somebody inside a coffin. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. When I was five, my brother was murdered. I was going into kindergarten that year and I spent a portion of the school year on the witness stand having my father convicted for that crime. My mom was 35 when she died. I've always wondered over the years exactly what dreams may have, have died inside of her. Well, I'll be 35 this year, which is maybe one of the reasons why I'm so hell-bent on getting out there, pushing the envelope, following my dreams, and facing fears. Because fears are just an illusion. I'm excited this year because I'll be publishing my book where I've told a little bit more about that story. But there's still so much laid out that I have no idea how to conquer. But each day, you just 
get a little bit closer. You do one more step. Follow one more goal. You know, all along, you hear over the years about these people that we envy in, in the tabloids, that they're no different than we are. And it's so true. The only difference is that they had a dream. And they had no plan B. They went after it until they made it. And you can do the same. I don't care what your dreams are, how big or how small. I want you to go back to that resolution list and make sure you aren't playing it too safe. If your dreams are huge, then just break them down. What can I accomplish in a month? What can I accomplish in a week? What can I accomplish tomorrow? Work your way back. Make these things attainable. Because if we keep setting the same resolutions every year, what is it that we are telling ourselves? That we're not good enough. I'm telling you right now that I'm no different than you and we're no different than them, than Adam Sandler, than Gwen Stefani, than No Doubt. We just have to step up to the plate. And I think 2013 is the time to do it. Please, if you think this message is valuable and you'd like to share it with anybody in your circle, I invite you to do so. Also, you're welcome to leave a comment below.